All right, welcome everyone. My name is Liz. I want to welcome you all to Art at Home, sponsored by the Hoboken Public Library. Much great thanks to the Hoboken Library for being such a phenomenal library and supporting the arts during this time of pandemic when many of us are forced to spend innumerable hours at home. And the arts have been such a saving grace in this time of anxiety and stress. But things are getting better and I'm so thrilled today because we, for our final artist of August, have got just the most exuberant, joyful and celebratory artist to look at and focus on. So, and that is our theme for August and has been for the entire month. We are looking at artists who are celebrating life because this is traditionally in the United States, the month of vacation and school holidays and doing all things fun, usually out of doors. Our artist for today is a woman named Nikki de saint -Fal. Nikki, as she became known, Nikki is, was her nickname. Nikki was born in France. She was a French American artist. She was born to a French father and an American mother into an extremely wealthy upper middle class family. They ran a, an investment banking business in France, but unfortunately Nikki was born exactly a year after the great crash of the American stock market. And Nikki's father's uh, particular branch of the family business failed. And at that point, uh, Nikki, was forced to go and live with her maternal grandparents while her parents and her older brother moved to Connecticut to live. So as a very, very young child, Nikki went to live with her mother's parents, interestingly enough, um, they stayed in France and they lived in a city that was basically in the heart of France. And she spent really not that long there, the first three years of her life, and then reunited with her family in Greenwich, Connecticut. She had an extraordinarily difficult childhood, maybe the worst of all the artists we've talked about thus far in August. Her mother was very violent. Um, I would say probably crazy woman. She beat her children. She would do things like force them to eat, even if they weren't hungry. So she was a difficult person to live with. Uh, Nikki revealed later in life that her father sexually abused her. So she was hit from both sides as a young child, and it was difficult for her. Both of her elder siblings uh, committed suicide later in life and it's Nikki so herself. No. Guys, please it's remember so to mute. Well, I mean, please remember to mute. Thank you. Um, Nikki herself attempted suicide. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And thankfully it failed. All right, so she is considered an outsider artist. She never had formal training. She is self-taught. She never went to art school, but throughout her life, she collaborated with some very famous artists, famous in the American canon of art, people like Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Larry Rivers, uh, the composer John Cage, and the architect Mario. 
She worked closely with the Swiss kinetic artist, Jean Tanglé, who she later married. Uh, they were only married for two years, but they collaborated for the rest of uh, Nikki de Saint-Fel's life. They were very close companions and collaborated closely as artists. Uh, an American critic once said that uh, Sam Fow was an extremely important artist. He said, quote, the French born American race artist is one of the most significant female and feminine artists of the 20th century and one of the few to receive recognition in the male dominated art world during her lifetime. And that part is definitely true. Nikki de Saint Fau, for most of her life was completely unknown in the United States. She became kind of a big deal in Europe, but in the US, she was more known as a model. Um, when she finally finished high school, she uh, was in and out of multiple schools. She frequently um, was kicked out of different schools. She went to places like the Brearley School in New York, where she claims she became a feminist. She, she credits the Brearley for teaching her the importance of women in the world. Um, but she was kicked out of there and she was kicked out of multiple Catholic schools that she attended. She was brought up in a very strict uh, Catholic tradition. But she finally graduated from high school and she became a model. She was a very gorgeous woman and she spent several years in a modeling career. What else? While she was at the Brearley School, I thought this was interesting. She let the she met the granddaughter of Henri Matisse, Jackie Matisse, and they became lifelong friends. She was dismissed from the Brearley School. This is so classic to Saint Fau because she painted red fig leaves on the school's classic statuary. I think that's wonderful. She married early. She married a man named Harry Matthews, whom her father had introduced her to when she was only 11. But six years later, she uh, met Matthews again on a train to Princeton by coincidence, and they became friends and married at that young and tender age. They moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Matthews studied music at Harvard. And it was here that de saint Fal began painting in oils and gouache. They had their first child, first of two, in 1951. And they moved to Paris. So she was at that point back in Europe. They moved to Paris where he studied, Matthew studied at the Ecole de Musique. Uh, while she was in Europe, however, de saint Fal became much more rebellious. She really hated the bourgeois lifestyle of the wife and mother, and she started breaking away from her responsibilities as a wife. And their marriage was kind of loose and non-traditional as well. They, they both had lovers and they, were kind of peripatetic and traveled all over Europe together and were very, very casual in the way they raised their two children. Uh, she attacked and confronted her mistress while they were staying in Nice and attempted at that point to commit suicide. She took an overdose of sleeping pills, but luckily because she was in a highly manic state, it didn't work. But Matthews then put her into a mental clinic in Nice, and this turned out to be very serendipitous for her art career, because at that point, she was given six weeks in this clinic in which she was able to start really getting into the creative process, and she began painting really in a concentrated way with oils 
and gouache and different materials. She was given electric and insulin shock therapy. And I guess it worked because she was discharged after six weeks. Uh, the family then moved to Spain where she fell in love with the architecture of Antony Gaudi. Uh, those of you who've been lucky enough to go to Spain and see the architecture of Gaudi know that it's incredibly fantastical architecture with all kinds of bits and bobs of mosaic things stuck into it and oddly shaped structures uh, with kind of stalactites and stalagmites hanging off the sides of the buildings. And this was an aesthetic that really appealed to her. And at that point, she too started gluing found objects to her work and really getting into that kind of a more naive style of oil painting. She had her first art exhibition in 1956 in Switzerland. And that's where she met the Swiss artist, Jean Tangli, who at that point was also married to another artist. But he helped her to create her first large scale sculpture. And these are the works that made de saint extremely famous uh, later in her career. And we're gonna talk a lot about them today when we look at images of her work. But Tangli was a sculptor most famous for his kinetic moving sculptures. And he, de saint talked him into creating the wrought iron uh, armature for the, the piece that she built. She covered the armature in plaster and then painted it. All right, in 1959, she, started looking at the artwork of modernists like Eve Klein, Marcel Duchamp, Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Robert Rauschenberg, and again, Jasper Johns. And these people really created an artistic crisis for her. And she switched from oil paints to using gouache and gloss paint and making assemblage with household objects and cast offs. Those of you who've worked with me in the past, you know assemblage are kind of mini sculptures usually created within a box frame in which the artist glues found materials to do three-dimensional collage. At this point, um, Nikki split with her husband. Matthews moved into a, an apartment with the two children he had given up his music career and he had become an author. He also had finally inherited some wealth from his family and was financially independent. And at this point she was on her own, but Matthews, the ex-husband would occasionally buy her artwork in order to help her financially. And she would periodically visit him and the children. She did not break fully with her family, but they no longer live together. She moved in with Jean Tangli, who separated from his first wife. They eventually married, but only married for two years, but they lived together and collaborated closely for over a decade. All right, and in 1960, Tangli made a very important introduction for her to a man named Pontus. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name. Forgive me for this. I think it is Poul Ten. He was the director of the Moderna Musette, the modern museum in Stockholm. And he invited her to participate in multiple important exhibitions over the years. And he later became the director of the Centre Georges Pompidou and had her exhibit her work there as well. So her career was expanding. Her, her fame was growing all over Europe at that point. All right, now we get to the 60s and things start really literally heating up for Nikki de Saint-Paul. This is the part of her career. I find so exciting. Uh, 
she started making these pieces that she called tirs. T I R S. Let me put that in the chat for you. Tirs. These are target pictures, and likely they were inspired by the paintings of Jasper Johns of targets. They were very violent and she made no bones about it. So they were paintings that had targets in them. They were sometimes not completely visible as targets. Nevertheless, there were targets in them. Sometimes they had collage things on them. Sometimes found objects were glued to them. So they were assemblage slash painting images. And she would hang balloons filled with paint in front of them. And she would then take guns and she would fire at the balloons filled with paint and the paint would spatter all over the paintings. She would fire through the balloons at the targets and the paint would splatter all over the painting assemblage and create these incredible explosive paintings. And frequently the canvases also had razor blades and knives embedded in them, and chunks of plaster, et cetera, et cetera. She did those for about three years. She would put baby doll arms in them and all kinds of stuff. And she, she said that the paint was bleeding all over the canvas. So this was about an expression of violence and they definitely attracted a lot of media attention and they made her famous. There, I have seen them. If you, there, there was a wonderful, somebody said it's still on, I think. There is a Nikki de Sanfal, uh, exhibit at PS1 in Brooklyn, I really recommend it. And there are some of these works on display. I don't find them particularly interesting, but there are videos of her in the act of shooting the pistols and rifles at the balloons filled with paint. And I find the videos interesting. So this put her in the ranks of the avant-garde uh, along with other performance artists like Rauschenberg and Ad Reinhardt and Fred Frank Stella and Ed Keenholz. She would organize these indoor events at art galleries where she invited onlookers to participate and also shoot at the balloons to spray paint all over her collage. Okay. Finally, in 1962, she had her first one woman show in New York City at a gallery run by Alexander Iolas. And she had an exclusive open air shooting in Malibu where guests included Hollywood celebrities like Jane Fonda. So her fame was spreading now to the US. She was quite the character. Okay, so that was the early 60s. In the mid 60s from 1964 until really her entire life, she started creating these extraordinary pieces called Nanas. And her Nanas are a celebration of the various roles of women. These are the true expression of her feminist ideals. And she became one of the most prolific sculptors, female sculptors who has ever lived. She started by making these, they're really life-size dolls of women. They're frequently giving birth. Sometimes they have multiple heads. The original ones were small and they were soft and made out of fabric and paper mache. But as they grew in size, they became monumental and they had iron armatures. 
Then she went on to start using fiberglass and polyester resin um, and painted them with acrylic and polyester. And in fact, later in life, she became quite ill, probably because of her exposure to all these chemicals that she worked with for many, many years. And these images, these nanas, really were in protest to stereotypical images of women. They were the antithesis of the stay at home, in the kitchen, in the nursery mom. They are just so vibrant and colorful and joyful. All right, and they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that she started creating an entire garden called the Tarot Garden that took her her entire life to create. And one of the biggest and first uh, Nana's that she created, it, was in the, the museum in Stockholm in the Moderna Musette, and it's called Hun. And guests were able to walk into Hun. Actually, I hope this is okay to say on public library site, but you walked, the entrance was through her vagina, and you would walk inside, and there was a fully operational kitchen and dining room and there it was huge it was enormous and as i said she worked her entire life creating this tarot garden she created a children's playground in israel filled with these nanas and also monsters she had quite uh, an imaginative, imaginative um, creative life. And she made multiple books, illustrated books, uh, including children's books that were inhabited with these fantastical creatures that she created alongside her Nana. So there were dragons. Um, she frequently used snakes as symbols and monster creatures. All right, I think enough said about her work. She did uh, die, of course, as we all must. <laughs> what year did she die? She died in 1991. And she did die, I believe, of cancer probably because of her exposure to all the chemicals that she used in her life. And she died in La Jolla, California, where she moved for health reasons. She did work, I do wanna mention this, she worked at the, the end of her life uh, supporting AIDS research. She was very, very uh, committed to helping people who suffered from AIDS. One of her most influential and close allies was her, one of her assistants who died of AIDS. I think I had the date of her death was wrong. She died in 2002 at age 71. Tangley died in 1991. So she was committed to AIDS research. She uh, made multiple children's books about AIDS that uh, the proceeds of the sales of which went to support AIDS research. All right, anybody have any thoughts or comments about the life of Nikki de Saint-Paul? I think she was overlooked and underrated for a good deal of her life. Unfortunately, for a female stereotype, I think because she was so incredibly beautiful that she was often um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Overlooked, dismissed because she was a beautiful woman. Okay, let's look at pictures of her work. Let's look at one of her paintings. Now, let's start with her sculpture. Now, if we were working in person, we would definitely be doing sculpture today because I would be schlepping all the stuff for you to use. So this is one of her nanas. The first nanas that she made were, were small, as I mentioned. And this is actually one of her later small ones. The, the original ones were matte and not shiny or brightly colored. She preferred in the first ones to keep them more in the earth tone palette. So they were more muted and more mud colored, I guess you would say. But in order to make them, as she started making more and more pieces that had to be displayed out of doors that she wanted to have uh, resistant to the elements of weather, she found that she had to use these resins and, and polyester paints. So the colors had to become more vibrant and shiny. And she grew to love that aspect. So a lot of symbolism in her work. She was a lover of tarot and all the symbolism inherent in, in tarot cards. I'm not very knowledgeable about that, unfortunately, if any of you are in class today, feel free to hop in and explain what some of these symbols might mean. Her Nana were frequently voluptuous like this. She liked making the figures fleshy and curvaceous. Absolutely wonderful balance in this figure to make the figure balance on one foot and the, this figure is tilting as well. This shows that she had quite a wonderful sense of balance in her work. This was difficult to achieve. And you could see where she might be shoved aside as a not too incredibly serious artist. I mean, they do appear to be whimsical, but her intent was just to celebrate what she felt the joyfulness of life was and to try and help women escape from what she thought was the drudgery of everyday life. She was trying to release women from the bourgeois lifestyle that she felt she had been trapped in. No comments? Okay, we'll move on to another image. I had a couple of comments, Liz. Go for it, Jane. <laughs> so They'll first- probably apply to everything we look at. <clears throat> Great. Great, yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned uh, her time in Spain and Gaudi because it made a lot more sense to me to see how she was influenced. Um, before that, I'd be like, well, wow, where did this come from? So, um, and I also thought the image of the, what did you call the, na the Nana? They're called Nanas, yes. Yeah, so I thought what was interesting was that the emphasis was on the torso 
on the on being a woman um less emphasis on the head it was just you know she she did form a head and all the parts of the body but it was clear to felt to me like she was emphasizing you know i am woman i'm i have these unique features that make me a woman and she was celebrating that absolutely yep and notice too there are no features yeah which is another and this is something in my own work when i make my dolls they have no faces so that does i i guess I've never really understood why I don't put faces on my work. It's completely subconscious, but in a way, in her work at least, it it doesn't distract from the figurative aspects of her work. And you're absolutely right. She wants you to focus on the curves. Definitely the nurturing, womanly aspects of the figure are all important to her she makes no bones about the fact that she finds the woman incredibly important so these are becoming more abstract less representational I mean, it almost, are these leg stumps? Are they extra breasts? Are these arms or breasts? It's not really clear. Getting more decorative. I believe these pieces are part of the tarot garden. And in the tarot garden, she actually has, she lived there. She created a Nana that was so large, it could be lived in. Keith Herring lived in that structure as well for a while. She inv invited him to do a mural in the tarot garden. Um, you could see where she and Keith Herring would have a close affinity for sure. Gorgeous color. Um, not a whole lot of color mixing in her work. She likes using the color straight from the can for the most part. Very simplified shapes. All the form comes from the structure itself. I'm not Thanks. sure the material in these. I'm guessing it's some kind of polyester resin. It looks yeah. like plaster, but I don't think it is. Yes, Katie. I Oh, Stephanie. Katie. Stephanie. Stephanie. Go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, I see such a dichotomy between a grown woman and a child in her work uh -huh. so far. Very childlike. I it it's I don't think you get any argument from her about this, although she did. She did sometimes bristle at that comparison to children's work. Um, but when you see her work in person, you can tell that she's appealing to children. She, mm -hmm. has, she has no bones about the fact that she wants children to love her work. And she certainly had, she took a lot of joy in, in being commissioned by Israel to create a playground. Right. She loved working on that project. Um, so yeah, I mean, she had such a troubled childhood. Right. She, 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 she didn't reject her own children, but she certainly was not- Present. A nurturing, right, present mother to them. So maybe that, was part of her work in the expression in her work. I, I don't know. I don't know. Hard to say. It is hard to say. 
I'm sure if you read more about her and the philosophy behind her work, you'll learn and understand more about what she was trying to achieve. My goal today is just to get you to appreciate the visual aspects of her work. Right. She, she really gets negative space, doesn't she? I love the yeah. black shapes surrounding these white shapes in this figure. That makes it pop. Yeah. And then little details like these circular things in the petals of this flower. All right, let's look at a few more and then I'm gonna give us our assignment for today. We'll look at one more sculpture and then um, we'll look at a couple of paintings to get you primed for what we're gonna do. And that one's hard to look at. We're not gonna look at that. Let's try this one. Again, I really do, if it's still on, I really had such a great time at her exhibit at PS1. If you get a chance, do go. It's not hard to get there. Where is PS1? It's, is it Queens? I said Brooklyn, but I think it's Queens. I misspoke. It's in Queens. It's, it's um, a branch of MoMA. And the whole museum is filled with her work. All right, here you can see she loves snakes. She also um, kind of halfway through her career, she started designing things like perfume. She created the perfume bottles. She made jewelry. Uh, she printed scarves. She did whatever she had to do to sell things to raise money for the Tarot Garden project. She was frequently maligned for doing that kind of commercial art, but she said, I don't care what people think of me. I wanna raise money to, to finish this monumental project. And I believe we have to hand it to her for, for following her dream. Now, who's winning here? Is the snake overwhelming the Nana or vice versa? Or are they friends? Are they in it together? But isn't the gold of that snake magnificent, especially where it wraps around the Nana's torso? I think it's jewelry. Her jewelry, why not? Again, balanced on one foot. She loved dance, Nikki de saint She often collaborated in her exhibitions with dancers. They would perform in and around her pieces. I'm struck uh, by how much movement. Yes, you can see. In, in this sculpture. Yeah, great observation, yes. so much movement. The snake and the Nana both have yes. a lot of flowing movement. It's interesting too, how such a voluptuous figure can appear to be so delicate on one foot. I love that. And the sweep of the leg behind her. Powerful yet kind of flowing at the same time. Interesting too, the arms are always shorter than the legs in the Nana. I think that's probably because she needed more weight on the bottom to support the top of her pieces. The heads are always tiny, I'm guessing, probably for the same structural reasons. Love that piece. Okay, let's look at some of her paintings and then we're gonna go to work. We're gonna have fun in our project today. So 
So this is one of her paintings. You can see how involved she was in her fantasy life. Her imagination was very rich. She frequently used texts in her paintings and drawings. This could be an illustration from one of her books. And this is the kind of thing I want to encourage us to do today. We are going to work completely from our imagination today. In fact, if you have a tarot deck, I should have put this in your materials list for this week. If you have a tarot deck, pull it out. If you know where it is, pull it out and start looking at the imagery in your tarot deck. It might help you. I have one somewhere. My husband was a big tarot guy. But it's kind of a confusing composition, but somehow it works. Any ideas why this works? Anybody want to share what you think? Well, I see a lot of perspective Yes. One thing, another thing is at first, I don't see people, you know, I see shapes and, and then you look into it more deeply. And then there's a lot of faces, there's a lot of people, there's, there's animals, there's all this stuff going on, but you, you don't see that at first, you just see color and shape and. Right. Yeah. Right. It's, it, I love it. Right. The yeah. more you look at it, the more you see. Yeah. And I think one of the things that makes this composition work is its busyness. The fact that it's so overloaded with texture and shape and color. There's so much variety that it compels you to look at it longer and longer. You want to see more and more and more. And the fact that she's used these kind of fantastical creatures piques your curiosity. But you can tell she's not a trained artist and yet her work is incredibly beautiful. You don't have to go to art school for 29 years to do beautiful artwork, guys. You do not. One last image. I hope this isn't just a close-up. No, okay, this one is completely different. Darn, we should have looked at these images. This one should have been first and the other one second, but be that as it may. This one's a little bit dark and unusual for her. Actually, this, sorry, this is not that a painting. like a photograph. Yeah, this is the tarot garden, sorry. But it could easily become a painting. This is the tarot garden, and this is the structure in which she lived, Keith Haring lived for a while. So this is actually a house in which people can live. And where is that, Liz? Isn't it incredible? You know, I realized, I don't remember. Oh, okay. It's just, it, on first- I uh, want to say Italy. It's somewhere, I think, in Northern Italy. Okay. Wow. It immediately makes me think of the Gaudi gardens, but it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's distinctive, but so fanciful. It is. I'm looking for where it's located. While we're working today, I'll find out. All right, I'll look it up while we're working because I want to know. 
and I hate that I can't remember. Yeah, isn't it incredible? Yeah, you can see why she was influenced by Gaudi. So many of these structures are reminiscent of his architecture. She had a, an army of workers help her with this, but it took, I don't know how many years to complete this project. All right. Here's our assignment for today. I want you to create a phantasmagorical picture. I want you to completely go into your imaginative world. I recommend that you just start scribbling on a piece of scrap paper first and see what emerges. Aha, thank you, Jane, for researching. In Garavicchio, I think it is somewhere in Northern Italy. I'm gonna confirm that. Oh, and Heather said San Diego has the largest concentration of her public artworks. This I did not know, awesome. But we are gonna create a painting or you could do a drawing with, if you have them, I would recommend Rayola markers because they have the most extraordinary colors or oil pastels, some kind of drawing material that's very, very, very bright. If you have no images that are coming up for you, then I would Google her work and try and find some pictures of hers that you could use as a jumping off place. You could copy or you could be inspired by her kind of imagery. Or if you have tarot cards, like I said, you could start looking at those kinds of images and symbols. But I bet that most of you, if not all of you, have some kind of imagery that you've stored away in your brain, shapes that you draw repeatedly over and over again when you're doodling. And I want you to go to those shapes, those primal shapes, and create a composition with them. Here are some of the universal shapes that you're all familiar with. You could use them as starting points too. The cross, the square, the pentagram, the triangle, the circle, the half moon, the spiral. All of these are universal shapes. The star, both five-pointed and six-pointed stars are universal shapes. Those are great places to start as well. For me, the spiral is the most inspiring shape on earth. I like to start frequently start my drawings with spirals. I'm gonna put the universal shapes in the chat box to help. So gather up your materials, find your paper, and let's begin working. Any questions, just Give a yell. Did anybody happen to catch on PBS last night, they had a wonderful documentary about the Americas, the great cultures of the Americas. Ah. It was terrific. All about the Native American cultures from Canada all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. I'm a big lover of Maya civilization.
and the cross is universal because of the east, west, north, south directions. Star. What have I missed? All right, no questions. Everybody knows what we're doing. Good, we have almost a full hour to have fun. You might wanna try, think back to those of you who've done it with me, um, a crayon resist technique with this one might be fun. You can draw first with crayon or oil pastel and paint over it. Oh, Steve didn't return with us today. He gave me his email address, but I never got it. Heidi or whoever was in charge last week stopped class before I could get his email address, darn. Does anybody know Steve? Did somebody bring him to the class? No, I guess not. Yeah, no, Steve is my friend. So Steve? I will I will uh, send him a text that you'd like his email address again, okay? Yeah, he's a, he's a very interesting artist and person. Um, or if you wouldn't, do you think he would mind if you gave me his email address? He, he gave it to me in the chat box, but then I didn't realize till the very end that he had done that. And the class was ended before I had a chance to get his email address, whichever you think is more appropriate. Lizzie, thank you. I just felt bad. I don't have his email, but I'm going to just text him. Okay, thank you. Tell him I'm sorry that I never was able to get his email address. So I would get a small piece of paper first, everyone, and scribble out some ideas and then transfer to your larger piece of paper. Um, in many ways, my work is very similar to Nikki de saint -Fals, although very different. I too make doll creatures. So that's what I'm going to do today. Think colorful, everybody. Joyous, joyous, joy. I'm starting first, pencil, light pencil sketch, just working out my composition.
Yes, so uh, Garavicchio is in Tuscany, the southernmost part of Tuscany, directly inspired by Gaudi's Park in Barcelona. And there is a book about it, no surprise. You can get it on Amazon. When you do your sketch, I would recommend that you don't put a lot of details, just very lightly pencil in the outlines of the shapes that you want to create. And think about using colors that are out of the ordinary. You notice the way she made her nanas orange or blue or yellow or red. Even though they're human inspired, they're not necessarily human color. Use your imagination. I will be right back, everyone. I forgot an essential thing, paper towels. Okay. Is that one?
So with this piece, I'm not even going to worry about mixing or doing a wash. I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to make it very loose and fast. I'm not going to think too much about what I'm doing. I'm using acrylics. I'm going right for the thick and opaque and bright colors right away. <laughs> my large shapes first, although I broke my rules. I should have started with the background, but I didn't. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. But Nikki was all about breaking the rules, so I'm gonna break the rules today too.
No complaints. Everybody happy? Good.
Please remember to mute everyone. Everyone's working well. So I've almost finished my flat shapes in my composition. Probably will not get some detail work today. That's okay. layer. Oh, you can see a little better.
Okay, I'm busy. You okay? Yep. Good. Might want to mute again. Thank you.
just two minutes till sharing. <laughs> So as you can see, I've, I've gotten down my flat shapes. It's probably even difficult to see what's happening in my picture, but that's fine. This is just the beginning. And I wanna go back and start outlining and adding patterns and details. I had fun using, I just used the color straight out of the bottle, except for my green, which I mixed. A little disappointed with the red. I wanted the red to be way more vibrant than it actually is. But I'm gonna keep working on that. Okay, one more minute. up who our artist is for next week. Gosh, it's going to be September. interrupt everyone in the creative process. I so hate doing that, but our time is running out. I want to talk about briefly about September. September and October, mid-September to mid-October are is uh, Latino American History Month. So we are going to start with a Mexican 
artists. We're going to be looking at artists from all over uh, North, Central, and South America, and also from Spain. Um, but our first artist is Mexican, and his name is Jaime Dominguez Montez. I have his name in the chat box for everyone. And he is an artist who's inspired by geometry and architecture design. Crafts. I think you're going to like his work tremendously. All right. Who's up for sharing today? Katie, you're first in my queue. You look like you're good to go. Yeah, I just, um, I didn't fill in the background. Let's see if. Oops, wait, Katie, something happened. I want to spot it. I don't know how much it's showing. I started with this figure here. Oh, good. I'm, and you, are you using markers? Yeah, it's the Crayola um, markers. Yes. Yeah, they're the perfect colors for this. Yeah, this is what I have. And cool. so it's just, I tend to work most frequently in curved shapes. And so uh -huh. I started with the figure that was up here and then I added in the figure here and just put some background together, but didn't feel that adding it. I liked having all the white space there. I think it you shows like sort of um, a lot of movement and motion and color. And that's what I went with. Loving it. You Thank might you. want to, I know you like all this white space, but if you have watercolor paint, you mm. might want to take a very pale color and create a wash. Don't go right. too close to the Crayola though, because it will okay. spread. If you get water on the markers, it will spread. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Great. Awesome, Katie. Thank you. Doris, you're next in line. Want to share today? Good morning. Whoa. All right. <laughs> like the composition, love the colors. It's a combination of a tarot card and uh -huh. uh, the sun, the sun and the stars. Okay, and I would make the same suggestion to you. Do something colorful with the background as well. You don't have to color in all the white, but maybe some areas like in between these, I guess, I don't know if they're lightning bolts, but they look like lightning bolts. But underneath the star and in between these zigzaggy shapes down mm -hmm. to the curved edge of the, of the circle, you might want to fill in those spaces with color. Good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. I love the snaky lady. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, I got carried away. Very carried away. Getting carried away in art is great. Oh, look at this. Were you looking at tarot also? Yes. Awesome. That's awesome. the sun. Um, I don't know what to do with it. It's like color, um, color, color. Get into yeah. the color now. And so the okay. horse and figure make them unusual colors. Oh, good idea. Go for it. Yep. Oh. I awesome. did tar tarot. I did tarot cards reading of them until I read someone's death and then I threw them away. I don't blame you. Yeah, Very my scary. Husband, my husband also was a big tarot person, but he said, "Don't mess with it. It's very scary stuff." I threw it under a car and let them drive over it. It was really scary. Okay, good. All right, but now <laughs> it's in an art form. It's completely non-lethal. Right. So would you would you do crazy colors like crazy on here? Make the horse yeah. purple, for example. Okay that kind of thing. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. It's great You're drawing. Welcome. Great Thank you. drawing. Margo, are you up for? No, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm still looking for my tarot cards. I did a sketch, but I'm not ready to share. <laughs> all right. We all have days like that. Trust me. I wish I'd thought to put the tarot cards as a suggestion in the homework list, you know, on the supply list in the email. So forgive me. Yeah, that's that. okay. That's okay. But I've got two decks. One's like more Western cowboyish, and yes. the other's more standard. Cool. But I don't know where either of them is. Well, if you do something, send me a JPEG, please. Yes, we'll do. All right, good. All right, Jane, you're next. Hey, I was working on other things. Um, That's okay. But uh, I, uh, I feel like I have sort of a, uh, I'm developing the, the, uh, the art muscles. I get a little bit overloaded sometimes. So, and as you know, I'm still working on my Monet. So. Okay. Thank you. Next time. Robin, you're up next. Do you want to? Yes, I do. Just want to say, First of all, I so much appreciate that you give us direction <clears throat> that allows us to do something that we would never think of doing on our own. So awesome. this, this is- um, Oh, look. I, oh, isn't she wonderful? Mother and child. And I, would, I just started drawing very briefly and then started painting. And I never would have done anything like this. So I love it because it's something from me that I don't know anything about. You know, he's delightful. <laughs> and it frees you up in other ways to create your yes. own style. Now, That's when it's dry, Robin, if you have colored pencils, you might yeah. want to work with colored pencils with your outlining in detail. Oh, but okay. wait till it's dry. Okay. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Great. Alice. Welcome, Alice. Do you want to share today? Alice. Yay! Up a little higher. Yes. Oh, it's terrific. She's a, she's like a monster creature, right? I think you're muted, Alice. Alice, you look great. I love your hair. Whatever you did to your hair looks super. Oh, thank you. Anyway, it's just a little fun thing I did. It's awesome. Very fantastic. I love it. Okay. Great. <laughs> Great. Great colors. I love the texture in the tail. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you're here and thanks for sharing. Great drawing, Alice. All right, Susan. Okay. I didn't color yet. I have magic markers, 121 markers. So I will be coloring. Oh, and you're, and you're with your skulls again. Love my it. My skulls and a flying cat and my, my Hamzas and my eyeballs. <laughs> yeah, the Hamzas right. are this great. It's going to be awesome. Send me a JPEG. Did, I will. Did you catch the show on PBS last night about the no. American? Oh, God. No, Look on their website. It. it was awesome. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Thank you. you. You're going to love it. Great okay. drawing. All right, Heather. Um, at the end, I started cutting things up, so Ooh. it's, oh, look oh at wow, that. that's fabulous. Um, I'm still oh, trying terrific. to, it's sculptural. Adhere. Yeah. Oh, it's adhere it. Yeah. It's, be careful. It's going to fall off. The I know. I know. I love always it. Love, always love to see what you do, Heather, because you work with fabric. <laughs> and rocks. And rocks today. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. So a little bar relief. Terrific. Thanks, Heather. And Pat. Hi. Um, oh, look at beautiful color. It's like a landscape with like a two tree, lots yes. of color. Um, I do a little crayon recess, but I think yeah. I cover 
mostly with the paint. I love the composition. The, 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 tree, the trees look 3D. Do you have something glued on or is it? It just, I have like the thick paint and thick like paint. the highlight. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. I love the composition of it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Pat. You, Liz. All right, Lizzie. Oh, we're getting through. We might see everybody's work today. Morning, Lizzie. Hello. <laughs> Hi. My video wasn't working, but now I got it to work. But yeah. Um, so I never did anything modern -y kind of. So I kind of used her shape, but put symbolism in it. But it's kind of political about Afghanistan. <laughs> oh, awesome. <gasps> so it's like the family, the women left behind. This is America, son, but then there's a mix of, are they really free or never free? And then the tears. So it's a little downer. But it's wonderful. But it's on my mind. Mm. It's wonderful. I want, the, I want you to paint the background. Mm. But it's a very powerful image. I love it. Thank you. Thank so when you, you when you know this is just whatever, but do you have to have like a thought in your mind to portray a no, feeling? Lizzie, Lizzie, I said start with the scribble and see what happens. Yeah, it's hard to be that free. <laughs> it is it without is without a plan. It is difficult. Mm, mm. It is difficult, but look what you came up with. Mm. Well, thank you. Sometimes jumping off of the edge of the cliff is worth it. Sometimes the best things in life are the hardest mm. to do. And not a clear, when yeah. you start out, it's not clear. And that's one of the beautiful things about art is sometimes it gives you the opportunity to take the risk that you might never have taken before. That's true. And it surprises you by what it enables you to create. So congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. And try, I want you to try more of that. All right, Rima. Are you up for sharing, Rima? Do you have video? All right, Rima, I'm gonna I'm gonna bypass you because you're not responding. And I don't know that for some reason nobody else is in my queue. What happened? Then she'll pass on sharing. You missed her message. Oh, okay. Your video's not working too bad. All right, well, I guess that was the end of my list of people. There were 18 people. Did we go through the whole list? I guess some people left. Um, I have a question. Absolutely. When you were doing the background of the artist, you said you could tell that she was not a trained artist and I'm wondering how you could tell that. Um, that's really a good question. I think, I think that that was a very unfortunate remark on my part. I think that comes from my own training and my own, my own, my own. Hmm my own subjectivity. <laughs> I don't know how else to put that. Mm -hmm. 
my own stereotypical, my own biased belief system. And, but her work you can just is it. not sophisticated. I mean, someone else said that her work appears to be childlike and that is the assumption because it, it, it does look like work that what could have been that? done by a child. Oh, you do? Mm. Even though it does oh, have a certain amount of information. Mm. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Big, big, big. So that, that's a really Anything difficult there? question to answer, except for the fact that I think that comment reflects my own bias. Mm. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. No, I was just curious. Because, you know, if you go to MoMA, a lot of that modern art to me is like, what? <laughs> well, and my comment to that is a lot of it and is, it. And the zoom is okay. what, yeah, except nice. those artists oh, did it. Yeah, so. Just oh, as yeah. some people today did things that they ordinarily would never have done before and uh -huh. came up with brilliant creativity. So people, for example, if you think about Mondrian and the fact that all he did was paint different colored rectangles and you kind of look at that and think, well, any child could have done that. But the point is no child ever did. Mm -hmm. Mondrian did that. Mm -hmm. And Mondrian brought that to our attention and that's what makes it art. And that's mm. what makes it beautiful. So, could I just add to that? Yeah, artists spend their entire lives rejecting what they were taught in school and trying to capture the creativity of children. For example, oh. Picasso said, the only true art is children's art. Oh. The only authentic art, I believe, is the exact quote from Picasso. The only authentic art is children's art. Paul Clay oh. spent his entire life trying to paint like a child. So it's it's a really good question, but I'm I can't answer it probably to your satisfaction. Oh no. Because um I get it. But I thought I didn't get it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah. Hmm. So that that's what I would say. Mm. To your question, and I, I hope it at least begins. I mean, these are questions that have been asked over the millennium. You know, what is it that makes art art? And for me, there are many things that make art art. It is, first of all, the concept that the artist has, second of all, the skill. And most importantly for me, the enigma, the mystery. Most great artists create some kind of curiosity or a deep question in the viewer. You look at it and you have a question. You say, is this art? Why is it art? Why do I look at this sculpture and think, God, this is so beautiful? Anything else? Why has this image lasted through the centuries? Why is it so meaningful for people to look at? So those are the qualities for me that make art. Tied to philosophy. What about the lady Tina? Yes. Liz, can I just ask you one question? Sure, and then I hear Heidi in the background, which indicates we probably want us to stop. But I just you with that question. What what is the uh, medium I should use to outline my drawing, my painting? I did it in gouache, and you had suggested my outlining, but I I would go to like oil crepa or you could do you could use anything. If okay. you have colored pencils, they would be terrific. Uh, okay. Fine point markers would be great. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Okay, Thanks. Steve sent you his email, by the way. Steve, okay. the guy that didn't show up today, he he sent you his email, so it's in your 
it will be in your emails for you. I, to connect. Thank you. I, so I let Stephen. I don't know why. I remember letting somebody named Stephen. I think having... that was last week. No. <laughs> today. No. Uh, yeah, today I let him in. Well, maybe he's having computer issues. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say goodbye, guys. All right. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.